Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Marine Discovery Series. Uh, we have an excellent evening for you tonight. We've been joined by Millie Formby from BirdLife Australia and also Nick Coleman from Mid Coast Council. We're going to talk about a range of things, uh, shorebirds and how they connect our world. Really, really interesting stuff. So this evening's Marine Discovery Series is being uh, co-hosted by Hunter Local Land Services and Mid Coast Council. would like to say thank you to them, uh, to them for their involvement. It's going to be a great evening. So I'll just uh, introduce Millie. So Millie Formby is a zoologist and recreational pilot who first began learning to fly in 2016 to follow the shorebirds on migration. She currently works for BirdLife Australia as a project officer for their migratory shorebird program. And Millie also has a background in the arts and is an illustrator of the Wing Threads children book, co-authored with Jackie Karen, which will be coming out in 2021. To learn more about wing threads, you can visit wingthreads.com. And tonight, Millie's going to talk to us all about shorebirds. So hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Millie Formby, and I'm a project officer for BirdLife Australia's Migratory Shorebird Program. And thank you to Mid Coast Council for inviting me to speak tonight as part of the Marine and Catchment Discovery Series. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you all things migratory shorebirds. And by the end of this talk, I hope I will have you convinced that shorebirds are the most awesome birds in the world. But firstly, what exactly is a shorebird? <laughs> okay, well, shorebirds are a group of bird species that can't land on water like seagulls and other seabirds. And they don't have webbed feet either for that reason. And they're commonly referred to as waders because most of the time you see them wading around wetlands, mudflats and intertidal areas to feed. In Australia, there's more than 50 species of shorebirds and most of them are migratory. And they belong to several families with fabulous names like godwits and curlews, sandpipers, knot stints, snipe and pratt and coles. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with those birds, uh, if not you have at least heard of them. So shorebirds spend most of their time here in Australia during their non-breeding season, which for us is late spring to early autumn. Then around March to April, they take off on an epic journey all the way to the Arctic tundra to breed. And that's about 12,500 kilometres away. And to get there, they follow a bird migration highway called a flyway. And Australia is part of the East Asian Australasian flyway. And there's eight global flyways in the world. And the East Asian Australasian flyway has the most number of species and the highest number of individual birds as well, with about 6 million waders estimated to use that route every year. And to make that epic journey, they take binge eating to the next level. So just before they migrate, they eat lots and lots and their bills are adapted to feed on many different things that live at varying depths in the mud to reduce the interspecies competition. So they can detect that food in the mud too using pressure sensors in their bill that are called herpst corpuscles, which I think is the best name ever. And it works in the same way that bat echolocation works for them to detect prey. They like to eat uh, shellfish like pippies uh, as well as worms, uh, sea cucumbers, crab, shrimp and other invertebrates that are found in the mud and they build up stores of fat and protein uh, so that they can fly those long distances and some shorebirds will almost double their body weight in size from eating just these invertebrate foods. They also undergo some pretty big uh, rapid physiological changes just before they migrate too. So to be super energy efficient on the flight, they shrink the muscles they don't need for flying. So the muscles in their legs, but also in their gut because they're not going to be doing any eating or drinking on the flight. And the flight muscles they use, so the muscles in their chest uh, get bigger, but also their heart muscle gets bigger too so that they can pump more uh, oxygen carrying uh, blood around the body while they're flying because they actually flap their wings the whole way. They're not gliding like other uh, migratory species are. And on top of all of that, if that wasn't energy demanding enough, uh, they also need all this food so that they can grow new feathers. So that, as I mentioned before, they have a non-breeding and a breeding season. And they also have a non-breeding and a breeding plumage 
So this uh, red knot that I've got here on the screen is actually in non-breeding plumage. And the one I showed just before here uh, is in its breeding plumage. So it's sporting this beautiful brick red uh, coloration on the chest and head. So they molt uh, just before they migrate and um, just after they migrate too. Uh, so, and this uh, breeding plumage is all about impressing one another for mating. Now, the smallest species to undertake this epic migration is called the redneck stint. And it weighs only as much as a Tim Tam, about 25 grams. So it's just a little bird. And it can fly up to 5,000 kilometres in one go. Equally impressive is one of our larger shorebirds, weighing it at around 800 grams, the Bartow Godwit. And the Bartow Godwit holds the world record for the longest non-stop flight ever recorded for any bird species. And this particular Godwit I've got on the screen is a very famous female Godwit. Her name is E7, and she was fitted with a satellite transmitter in New Zealand in 2007 and was then tracked crossing the Pacific Ocean on migration from Alaska to New Zealand on a continuous flight that stretched just under 12,000 kilometres over nine days. So she flew that entire way without sleeping or eating or drinking on the way. Now, when the shorebirds arrive on the Arctic tundra up north, uh, they nest on the ground and their breeding plumage isn't just for attracting a mate, it also helps them to be super cryptic. And you can see here in this image, there's a bar-tailed godwit male sitting in amongst the uh, moss and lichen and grass there on the tundra. And uh, their eggs and chicks are also super camouflaged in this environment. So here's a picture of three bar-tailed godwit chicks sitting uh, in the nest. And the chicks are what we call precocial, which means they can feed themselves just after hatching. So they don't need mum and dad to go out and forage and bring food back for them, which is another thing that makes them different to seabirds. And the Arctic tundra is the perfect place to be a shorebird chick because there's millions of mosquitoes and other, uh, other insects in the Arctic summer for them to feed on. They also feed on uh, berries and such. So this migration ecology has evolved over time because the birds are exploiting these high energy rich resources at different times of the year. And there's also fewer predators on the Arctic tundra too. So they can, uh, that can prey on nesting adults and chicks, which are quite vulnerable, you know, nesting on the ground in that way. But what is probably most amazing though is that the adults leave on their southward migration before the chicks are, are old enough to fly and yet the younger birds that have just fledged and learnt to fly uh, know how to make their way back to Australia on their own at about six to eight weeks of age. So that's pretty incredible. And once they arrive back here in Australia, they'll spend the first uh, two years of their life uh, in, here in Australia or New Zealand or other parts uh, in the southern part of the East Asian Australasian flyway uh, before they become mature enough to start breeding themselves. And then they'll also start uh, making that migratory journey up to the Arctic to breed every year like their parents. So they're constantly chasing an endless summer between Australia and the Arctic. And we have records um, of tagged birds. So we do have a, a banding and flagging program for shorebirds here in Australia that's led by the Australasian Waiter Studies Group. And we have records of red knots that are more than 20 years old. So that means that during their lifetime, they will have flown more than the distance from the earth to the moon just on migration alone. And I think you'll agree with me that that is pretty amazing. Uh, their behavioural ecology, uh, though, also makes them quite vulnerable to extinction because they're relying on a lot of different habitats when they migrate. And the flyway is like a chain with links in it. And if any one of those links fails, the chain becomes broken. And indeed, they are the world's uh, most endangered group of bird species because some of the places they rely on to stop over and refuel on migration have become degraded or lost completely. 
And part of the problem around that is that the wetland places that they like to feed don't always look particularly appealing to humans. You know, they're boggy swamps or, you know, widespread mud flats and uh, with mosquitoes and such. So it makes sense why someone might think it would be an improvement to fill it in or, and build a block of flats or, or drain it for agriculture. And um, this is what's happened a lot around the Yellow Sea in China and Korea which is the major stopover in the East Asian Australasian flyway for migratory shorebirds. And some of those feeding areas have been reclaimed for development. And you can see in the image on the left, uh, a huge flock of um, godwits there in front of an area that's uh, being dredged for reclamation. Uh, fortunately, though, you know, we are making headway uh, with shorebird conservation in those areas. And last year, the Chinese government declared the Yellow Sea a World Heritage Area. So that was a huge win for shorebird conservation. But it's so important to conserve these wetland habitats, not just around the Yellow Sea, but also here in Australia and all throughout the flyway. Because as I mentioned earlier, the flyway is like a chain with links in it and all of those links in the chain need to be taken care of and the shorebirds spend most of the time here in Australia six months of every year so it's even more important for us here in Australia be to be taking the lead on that and looking after wet estuary uh, sorry wetlands and estuaries is not just for the birds but it's for us too because uh, wetlands provide us with all sorts of ecosystem services so you may not know, peat wetlands, for example, store 30% of the world's carbon. So they're helping to mitigate impacts of climate change. Uh, wetlands also absorb and store, wa store water. So they're helping to filter out and remove any pollutants to help provide us with a clean water supply. Mangrove wetlands provide protection uh, to coastlines against storm surge. And wetlands also provide us uh, with livelihoods and places of recreation uh, to billions of people worldwide. So wetlands, not just for the birds. And I think shorebirds are a wonderful living expression of how we are all connected to one another through this global ecological network of wetlands. And like many of us do, shorebirds call many places home along the East Asian Australasian Flyway and their migration links over 4 billion people in 23 countries and four continents. And that's over half of the world's population, which is pretty incredible. So shorebirds really do connect our world and they share a message with us that conservation is a way of caring for all life that includes people it includes us too so by now <laughs> i hope i've convinced you that shorebirds are totally awesome and as such i can only reason that you'd like to go and see some shorebirds yourself in your local area and it just so happens that the manning river estuary and nearby port stevens are two of the best places for shorebirds migratory shorebirds and uh, some of our resident shorebird species too uh, in new south wales so uh, port stevens is internationally significant for uh, the critically endangered eastern curlew which means there are regularly flocks of at least 1% or more of the total flyway population seen there at Port Stephens. And Manning River Estuary is uh, nationally significant for Eastern Curlew, which means that 0.1% of the population uh, is, or more is uh, seen regularly at that site. And uh, both uh, um, sites are also nationally significant for double-banded plover, which is a winter migrant to Australia. It's a bit different to all of the other shorebird species um, that I've been talking about. It actually migrates from New Zealand to Australia during the austral winter, and then it goes back to New Zealand during our austral summer. So it's a little bit different in that way. Uh, but all the other birds, as I mentioned, fly to the Arctic and back. And you can also see a lot of bartel godwits in this area, uh, Wimbrel, Pacific Golden Plover and Sanderling, uh, Grey-tailed Tatler and Sharp-tailed Sandpiper. So they're the most common migratory shorebirds that you see in uh, those two regions uh, nearby. 
As I mentioned before, your best bet for seeing shorebirds is between September and April during their non-breeding season. That's when they're here in Australia. Uh, but there's always a few what we call overwintering individuals around the place the, between May and August as well. So uh, I mentioned earlier that the birds don't start doing that migration to the Arctic until they're about two years of age. Some species it's three. So those younger birds remain here in Australia. So you could go out and see some of those juvenile birds. I know um, here in the Hunter, um, where I'm located at the moment, at Stockton Sands, there's quite a good flock there of Eastern Curlew and Bartel Godwin. I'm not sure about up at Port Stephens and Manning River. I haven't been there recently. But um, I'm sure if you went out there, you'd see a few birds around. So you can look up where to find different species, um, like those I just mentioned, in a birding field guide, if you've got one. I um, I like to use the Pizzy and Night app on my phone. I also have got the Australian bird guide which is uh, by CSIRO publishing which I like or if you're a bit more tech savvy uh, BirdLife have an app called bird data and you can actually go in there and look up Manning River estuary and see where different species have been seen and I've just got a map up here on my screen of the two sites uh, at Manning River estuary where they're the best places for seeing uh, shorebirds so at Harrington and at Farquhar Inlet there the old bar um, Yes, and if you want to, you can also uh, register for the bird, bird data online through BirdLife's website for free. And um, you can download the app on your phone too, and you can record any migratory birds that you might see there in the app, which goes towards helping our national shorebird monitoring program. So actually helping uh, contribute to some of the conservation efforts for migratory shorebirds uh, at, an, at an international level, which is just awesome. Uh, the other site I mentioned was Port Stephens, and um, that's internationally significant for eastern curlew. Eastern curlew and Bartel godwit are the two species you'll see the most around um, Port Stephens. Uh, and the best places there are around Swan Bay, Soldiers Point, and uh, Windawapa Spit near Corrie Island there. Uh, it's also the largest, well, I think Manning River Estuary actually is the largest site uh, in uh, of... Um, breeding it's the largest breeding colony sorry of little terns in new south wales and uh that's uh, highly significant too and there's a breeding colony at port stevens as well so, so they're both really important sites for shorebirds in australia and when you're out and about if you do go and look for some migratory shorebirds there's many things um, that you can do to help take care of those birds and the main thing is to minimize the amount of disturbance that you that you are due to those birds when you're out and about in wetlands and estuaries. So they need that energy uh, to be um, flying those long distances, as we mentioned, and restoring their feathers and stuff like that. So if you're constantly spooking them, they're wasting that energy on uh, disturbance and, um, you know, protecting themselves. And make sure if you go out with your dog on the beach, keep your dog on the leash. That's really important. And if you're in a vehicle on the beach or out in your boat or horse riding, that sort of thing, keep your distance. We say about 250 metres. And even if you're out just looking at the birds with your binoculars, it's really great to have a telescope, actually, if you go and look for shorebirds so that you can keep your distance and still have a really good look. Uh, try and stay about 100 metres away from the birds. I haven't gone into all of the different species today because there's so many of them and they're not the easiest birds to identify for a birding beginner. But if you're interested in learning more about shorebird ID, BirdLife have a wonderful range of free resources that are available online that you might like to take advantage of. Uh, there's the Shorebird ID booklet, which is very popular, and it's now available uh, online as a downloadable PDF. So you can go to the BirdLife website. I've put the link there on the um, slides, so birdlife.org forward slash projects forward slash shorebirds 2020 forward slash counter resources, which is a bit of a mouthful. If you just Google bird life shorebird ID booklet, it'll come up at the top of the listing and you can just click on it and it will go directly to that document. Um, on that same page, there's also some great resources on IDing water birds and, uh, and terns as well. There's a booklet called My Turn that helps uh, ID turns. 
So uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And um, yes, I guess I will go to questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Millie. Um, so just for everybody watching, as I mentioned before, there's a little um, Q&A button down the bottom. So if you just press on that, not the chat button, just the Q&A, and um, you can ask any questions, and then uh, we'll get Millie to answer them. Um, just while we're waiting, though, I thought that was really interesting, really, and particularly the way um, that they migrate such long distance. Like, you, you mm. don't really think about that in your head and just how far they're going. Um, you mentioned about tracking them and knowing how far they've gone. How do you go mm. about that tracking? What do you actually do in order to track the bird? Yeah, so um, that's with the Australasian Wager Studies Group, which I mentioned before. And we use two different methods. One is um, satellite ta tagging. So we have little devices that have um, a, a little solar panel battery on the back and they're fitted to the birds with a harness. And the way we, I should explain how we catch them actually, it's quite epic. Um, we use the technique called cannon netting. And it's um, what it sounds like, actually. We have big cannons that are attached to a net and the cannons are buried in the sand on the beach and uh, is strategically placed. So um, we usually do a recce trip beforehand to see where the birds are roosting on the beach of wherever we're targeting. And as the high tide comes in, the birds will flock and sit on the beach to roost and hopefully they sit in front of our net and then we can fire the cannons. So everyone's hiding in a bird hide far back behind the, the net and the net flies out over the top of the birds and then we're able to remove the birds from the net and pop them in hold, holding cages made of shade cloth and um, we can fit them with uh, uh, little metal bands and uh, identifying leg flags on, on their legs and um, some also get fitted with satellite tags as I mentioned. And those satellite tags uh, send back data about where the birds actually are and it's um, transmitted live, you know, during their migration. And it's really valuable information because um, we have an idea about where the birds go, but often it ends up being a lot broader um, we find out uh, exactly where they're going uh, and it's often on a much broader scale and um, we need to know that so that we can target which habitats need protection as well as at what times of the year those birds are actually there. Uh, the other technique we use is a geolocator which is a lot smaller um, and a lot cheaper as well. So a satellite tag costs about $5,000 for one unit but a geolocator costs $500. <laughs> the difference is that um, if you're using a geolocator, it um, doesn't transmit live information. You actually have to retrap the bird to um, retrieve the device and then you can download the data from it. So it doesn't work for birds unless they are a species that has high sight fidelity, which means they're coming back to the same place again and again year after year. And so some species that works really well for, like ruddy turnstones. Uh, we have a group of ruddy turnstones that uh, were captured on King Island and fitted with geolocators. And we've had a 50% uh, recapture rate over many years with those birds, which is really amazing. Uh, it's very, that's very high for um, any, any species of bird. And those geolocators, they can tell us longitude and latitude data, um, but they also tell us behavioural information like um, nesting patterns. So the geolocators record light patterns. So if the bird is sitting on a nest, the geolocator is covered up. So it comes through in the data as a darkness pattern. And we can tell when they're flying because it's a light pattern, but also um, the geolocators record conductivity as well. So if the bird's standing in salt water, you can expect that it's feeding because the um, it's picking up that conductivity. But if it's flying, you wouldn't have that conductivity pattern. So we also get behavioural data from geolocators. So it just depends what kind of information you're wanting to get. And, um, yeah, the uh, likelihood of being able to capture the birds again is the, which technique you choose, and that's how we find out those data. Um, there's another question that's been asked. Uh, do the satellite tags affect the bird's speed in flight? 
or any of those mm. issues? Yes, that's a really good question, and it's uh, it's really important. So um, we cannot fit anything to the bird that is more than I think it's more than um, two percent of their body weight, something like that. So they're very very lightweight tags. The geolocators weigh less than one gram. And uh, I think the biggest tags we fit to Red Knot are two gram. We have two gram and five gram satellite tags. The two gram ones go on species like Red Knot and the five gram ones go on larger species like uh, Wimbrel and Eastern Curlew. So, yes, it's very important that they're very lightweight so that they're not impacting on the birds in that way. And the harnesses are fitted in such a way too so that they're not going to... Um, impact on the bird flapping its wings or um, yeah interfere with its flight in any way and you know we've had we've had birds like our wimbrel um, that we've tracked for three subsequent years in a row and they successfully bred and things like that so we have um, indications that show that it's not not impacting on the bird's ability to breed or to make the undertake that migration and such which is which is good that's what we want <laughs> Yeah. Uh, next question, how many eggs a year do Eastern Curlew lay? Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure specifically for Eastern Curlew, but most shorebirds tend, tend to lay uh, three to four eggs. That seems to be a, a thing, yeah. Uh, is it possible that the shorebirds flocking near the dredging areas might be helping with managing environmental conditions? Environmental conditions. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if they think that, um, or if they're meaning that... Um, that are the shell birds there? Is it becoming a protected area, which is a little bit about what we're going to talk about with Nick? Oh, okay, yes. Um, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Not in, not in China. Um, I, I think um, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll answer that in a bit more detail after Nick's, uh, okay. Nick's talk because there is a long, long answer to that. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right, well, we might leave the questions there for now. We are going to have another opportunity for a Q&A uh, after Nick's um, his presentation as well, so there'll be more chances to chat with Millie. Um, but we'll move on. So I'll introduce our next speaker, who is Nick Coleman, who works for Mid Coast Council. He is an environmental officer with Mid Coast Council and he undertakes a lot of projects in our area. And one of those is working with our shorebirds. So um, Nick's going to give us a little bit of a presentation about what Mid Coast Council is doing in this area. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Thanks for that, Erin. I appreciate that. Um, just quickly to touch on, because I didn't talk about it in my talk, um, the dredge spoil. If there's dredging done in Manning, the Manning area, and we put the dredge spoil out, the shorebirds will we'll really like to, the shorebirds that I'm going to talk about really like to nest in it. So it's something that we think about and where we put the dredge spoil. And, but that's, yeah, that's probably not what you were talking about, the question was. but. Anyway, I'll share my screen. All right, so what we're talking about is the shorebirds that actually nest in, in the Manning area. So these are the, they, they nest in the summer periods, the same time as Millie's um, international uh, guests arrive, our ones, are, our ones are breeding and nesting up. These are the industry partners that we all, we all band together to work on, on the protecting our breeding shorebirds. So there's quite a few of this. And um, so, the, the, most of these slides, but, but I thought I'd bring it bring it to your attention now, and I'll point out a couple of the key ones. So the first key one is the volunteers. So we have a, a good network of volunteers, always looking for more, and they help gel everyone together. And as you'll see later, a lot of our management has to be at the spur of them. Volunteers are usually available and keen. The next person I'd like to point out is the shorebird ranger, Silas Darnell. He's he's uh, funded by the National Park Saving Our Species uh, funding, and uh, he does a lot of the monitoring, and he's on the spot for most of the time. So, um, but yeah, the uh, Tide, Mid Coast Council, um, Crown Lands, local land services, uh, all the bird groups, and the University of Newcastle is getting on board. Yeah, it's a it's a big project, but if we all do a little bit, it goes a long way. So, as Millie said, um, these are the the two main breeding areas for the birds I'm going to be talking about. Um, yeah, both areas are very dynamic. They will change over the years. Uh, but the the point the point to make here is that for in regards to the little turn, which I'll talk about in a second, 
uh, this is the most important breeding area colony in New South Wales. A quarter of the little terns that reach adulthood each year grew up in the Manning area. So to get onto the, the three birds, the shorebirds that, that nest here, so the little tern is the uplift one. Uh, it can migrate from Southeast Asia, comes in, in Australia in the summer, east coast of the, um, east coast of Australia, and it will, it will start, it will lay eggs in the October period, and around about April, it will have flown away. Juveniles could stay. The pied oyster catcher, uh, an endangered bird, it, it will stay here all year round, but it also breeds in um in the summer period on the beaches and the other beach is uh, the other bird is the beach stone curlew it used to breed here uh, fairly regularly there was one couple but one of them was taken we think was taken by a fox so they don't it doesn't breed anymore but uh one is still can be seen every now and then we're hoping you'll get a partner soon and start breeding up again so uh just to go on to what the so similar to the Millie's one that uh, breed up in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, these ones that breed here and they, they go by camouflage, but they use large open expanses of sand to lay to build a nest and lay their eggs So um, and go by camouflage. So there's no vegetation around. It's just open sand. They dig a little depression, lay two to three eggs. This is a little turn uh, nest. And after a period of time, the eggs will hatch. And then the chick will stay for a few days because it can't can't walk in that depression. And there's another picture of them there. So they rely on camouflage. Uh, it, it's just nothing to say that they're there, and they're easily they're easily trodden on. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, and after two or three days, these chicks can now run, and then they pelt off into cover. And then their their parents will feed them white bait and all that for, for quite a while. So in regards to management, so this is the some data we've got on the um, the little turn in our in, in the Manning region. So these are the number of eggs recorded from 1993 to 2020, and yeah, these are the number of fledged. So what we what we try to do is keep the number of little turn eggs and the number of fledged fairly at the same level. You're going to have you're going to have not all of them survive, of course, depending on. A number of factors out of our control, but we try to keep it keep it kind of relevant. There's two years I'll draw your attention to where that didn't happen, and that was 2001, where we had a number of eggs but zero birds, and that was due to a fox. And in 2017, it went down to just one or two successful fledged birds, and that was due to four-wheel drive activity. And then in 2018, we'll have we had no eggs laid here. From the little terms and they went down to window up uh, that time down in Hawks Nest and then they were starting to get numbers back up again. Uh, there is a slight downward trend in there. Uh, I don't know if that's across the board with all of New South Wales or just just here. I don't know that yet, but as I said earlier a little turn can to, to hang out in other countries so it could be other factors at play. So when we get together with the management strategies, we all band together, all those people in the first slide I showed you, and we all, we all start planning. So we go over what worked the previous year, uh, what didn't work the previous year, and what we need to do for this year's breeding uh, colony, and allocate tasks and resources to the people, and it just means that no one's over inundated and things can get moving, and then we set up a time frame so everything can be done in time. So just to jump into some of the threats, so as I said earlier, the fox um, devastated that colony a little bit earlier in about 2001. Uh, fox control and successful little bird, uh, little turn and quite always the catcher and uh, beach stone curlew breeding is hand in hand. You've got to control the fox. And that's been known since we started doing this back in, or ever started being done back in the early 90s, late 80s. Um, so, and this, this requires a multi-agency approach at private landholders, um, Crown Land, local land services council. We all get together and we start um, putting the baits out for the fox about three months before the shorebirds start arriving. Um, in the case of that 2001 example, we think one fox uh, was bait shy, didn't take the baits, 
and it got into the colony over a couple of nights and, and ate a lot. If, if ever, as we all communicate better and if a bait shy fox is determined, then we've got funding usually from the um, Saving Our Species or even Council to get in a, uh, a trapper and actually hunt down that errant fox. And this is a, um, so the baits are buried and this is a um, sample of a monitoring. So that's a fox footprint. And so we'll know. And, um, and on the left here is the bait stations, an example. But as I said earlier, it, it expands out into private land and all the rest and um, communication signage informing people that the baits are laid. So the next, uh, the next uh, major threat, the numbers of the birds taken over the period are here, is avian predation. And this is, um, this is crows, crows, uh, seagulls and gullbill terns. They, they take eggs and chicks. Um, some, some previous management, historically we've, we've tried putting wire cages on the nests, but after the eggs, eggs have been laid and that didn't work, the birds got a, they, they, those nests were abandoned, so that we disbanded. Other ways to protect them is we've tried, tried for a couple of years putting these shelters out and so the little chicks here that you can just barely make out would run into them. They didn't really work. Um, crabs liked them but the little birds didn't. Uh, so what, what they do like when they're at the running stage to avoid the predator is spinifex grass and driftwood. They, if that's there, that's what they would tend to run into. Um, there's uh, a study where, where for in, in regards to protecting the eggs, where um, Silas Dunnell, the, the ranger, and University of Newcastle was just starting out an honours project to start looking at some management strategies to protect the eggs. Uh, so that's just starting, so that'll be interesting. Hopefully he might be able to give a talk on this next year when we start getting some results in. Also, just out of interest, when we, as you can see here, there's a, there's a white tag where um, we will tag the nests to monitor them. And back in the early days, we would have used the cattle tag there and then the crows quickly figured out that when they saw the cattle tag, there was a nest nearby and then the nests were hammered. So that quickly got changed to that. The birds can't determine it. So it's something that you've always got to be on the ball, watching what's happening and adapting quickly. The other threat is people, of course. And um, the main, main threats there are domestic dogs, four-wheel drives and just walking on the, on the nests. And you know, you, I've been out there plenty of times and you, you do not, those eggs are so camouflaged and they're so much like rocks, you will not see them until you're really close. So um, the, the best way we can to negate the people effect is fencing. It's cheap, it's quickly put out. We, we put out one strand of baco, so it's really, it's really um, quick and simple. It's just an indicator. This is an example of Harrington. We'd put this net, we'd put this out before the birds arrive. We, we know where they're going to nest. We, we get the eye in. You know, you know what they like. And, um, we, we fence it out. And yeah, no, no four wheel drives, no, and no four wheel drives will ever go in there. It's just, it's been working very well. The next thing is, of course, signage. So for four wheel drives, um, just directional arrows to say which way to go. And for people, we, we trialled this sign first with the endangered shorebird information, a bunch of ecological information, and then, you know, no cars, no people, and no domestic dogs, it was no dogs. And what we found is that it was, people had to get up there to have a look, and it was a bit confusing messaging. So now we're trialling out the, the simple, you know, no dogs, and a little bit of information there of, um, of the shorebirds. Uh, just so when people are walking their dogs on the beach, Stick to the intertidal zone when the shorebirds are breeding in summer. Don't let your dog keep them on a leash. Don't let them run into that area, and it'll be fine because the the nests will smell like bird, and it'll attract the dogs to it. And if, you, if the fox is in the area, you can they actually find the nest. They plot along and find them, and um, it's a delicious egg there. Uh, the other signage is um, just a general informative sign showing where the shorebirds are. Uh, go and where you can and can't go and parking areas and walking tracks. Um, the third type of sign is educational. This is like Millie's talk earlier. It talks about um, all the migratory shorebirds that come visit and need the area to feed, a bit on the breeding shorebirds and a little bit of ecological information just to get interest into the and a bit of education. Uh, and in regards to education, 
So uh, for four-wheel drivers, there's the brochure, which is share the shore message, intertidal zones. They, the birds wouldn't um, nest or lay eggs in the intertidal zone, just get washed away. So there's that messaging and it's working well. National Parks does an education for school children, um, for shorebirds. Uh, and then on community events, we have uh, education days where we have models and we have a little interactive display for the kids to build clay eggs and bury them in. And so just to, just to demonstrate just how um, easy it is to put them to disappear and some videos as well on, on um, beach usage and shorebirds. So the, the third major threat is a big one and it's probably the biggest of all of them and that's environmental. So that's inundation, winds and storms. And yeah, that, that takes out the most, but uh, it's a dynamic environment. And this is where when we all work together as a group, it, it, makes, it makes, makes or breaks us really. It doesn't happen very often. Some seasons, I've never experienced it, but other seasons have. Um, once the shorebirds at all turns have laid their eggs and they're, they're established, you, there's, there is leeway. You can then raise the eggs up if it's going to be inundated on sandbags and sand and they won't get abandoned. And also um, in the 2013-14 years, the, the runners were collected into buckets when the inundation was happening. When the water went away, they were released again. And um, yeah, that works well. The, the parents still came back to feed them. Um, there's also other ways you could put um, flagging uh, bunting out if they don't want to nest in an area, or you could put uh, shore, models of shorebirds in another area to attract them there. Um, that's that's the main management strategies there. The other um, the other management strategies that we're doing now with national parks, we uh, we're collating all the 20 years of um, shorebird management strategies and data, putting that together. Just a, a little guide to know what works, what doesn't, just in case. Uh, is we don't trial the same things like the cages over the eggs. That won't be trialed again and focus on stuff that does work. So all the trial and error of previous land managers and volunteers, which is extensive, like the volunteer network is extensive and that's all being recorded well. So I think that's about it for me. Excellent, thanks Nick. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll do a little bit of a panel and I'll um, both Millie and Nick to answer some more questions. Um, that's some great uh, very interesting stuff that they're working on there, Nick. Lots of different things happening for the shorebirds in the, the local area, which is really fantastic. Um, obviously, it's it, as Millie mentioned before, it, it's mainly um, our uh, Medding area and then also down at Windawapa. Is there, there was a bit of a question before about Smith's Lake. It, are we finding that there's birds turning up in Smith's Lake area as well? I, I well, for the, for the, Laying of eggs, I haven't heard of it, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, these are the Winter Whopper in these two areas, uh, areas that I know about for, for um, eggs and, and breeding, but I, I, I don't know is the answer. And if it does happen, it would be good to contact council and let us know um, because these birds seem to keep going back to the same areas every year, but if something happens in one, they may shift. And or if the conditions at Smith Lake change to a way that they like, it's usually the sand is open, bit of spin effects, and um, close to close to um, or the ocean, of course, with white bait. If that if those conditions become better, they may move there. So it's a dynamic, changing environment. So it's it's always worth um, being open to it. Perfect. I, I just I, I would just say that um, it is it is like I, I've been doing this job for a couple of years now and. It's very heartening to see the community come together and just mm. just looking after the shorebirds and doing just a little bit, and it goes such a long way. Um, keeping the like the, the four-wheel drives are no longer a problem. That's going great. The people not walking in there. Do domestic dogs are are a problem. They just run in and go crazy a little bit uh, every now and then. But um, I'm just generally for how much um, yeah people are looking after the shorebirds. Um, and I, I do agree with Nick on that one. There's been some really good strides mm -hmm. move forward in the many areas in particular in the last few years, and, and it's, we're grateful to that community for doing it. Uh, so we have a couple of questions here now. First one being, do shorebirds go far from the nest to feed? Yeah, I I wouldn't know how far, but they definitely do. They always um they they usually leave one one on the nest while the other one goes up to feed, but 
what I've observed is that if there's like they like Harrington at the moment so much, I think it's just that they can go in, get a white bait, and come back to the egg, and they don't have to go too far because they only want the little fish to feed to the young. Um, they don't want to go too far because what 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 tends to happen is that the if it's a big colony of little terns and a seagull comes, um, they can defend they can defend the seagull quite effectively. One could take I've seen one little turn like defend like 15 seagulls have come along and it has just um, zoomed around and got rid of them all. But the more they are in one area, the more protective they are against gull bull turns and seagulls. So they don't go too far from what I can tell, but um, that's one of the important things about keeping these areas as people free as possible because um, they want to be over their eggs and they want to be close to their young. And every time they get spooked up, then the garble turn that's swooping in can can have a look. So um, I don't think it's not it's not very from what I can tell it's not very far and they are the eggs are protected fairly constantly. Another question, uh, sort of in relation to the Smith Lake as well, but um, somebody's saying that uh, little turns used to be found in Foster twenty years ago. I'm not aware of them being found down there, but what is what about you, Nick? I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised. Like I don't know, but I I, I would I would say yeah, this is a good it's a good area for little terns and it's such a popular area. I can't believe it's just been in these two sites. And I reckon um, they've been coming here for generations. And 20 years ago, Foster may have had something they liked and they would have capitalised. Um, really, next one sort of more directed to you um, yeah. because it. it uh, so the question says, it sounds like Mid Coast Council with collaborators are quite active in regards to, in regards to shorebird management. Um, but what about in places like Port Stephens, Newcastle and Lake Macquarie Council? Yeah, so um, BirdLife's been working with Hunter Local Land Services uh, recently to develop um, these site action plans for migratory shorebirds for uh, ports, yeah, for those three areas and where are my conservation lands as well. So, uh, yes, yeah, so it's been um, uh, not so much Lake Macquarie Council. Uh, we haven't been engaged there, but that doesn't mean we won't be in the future. So, uh, we, yeah, we've been collaborating with uh, local land managers and stakeholders and community groups to really... Uh, focus on coming up with a list of actions that are specific to those particular sites to help um, manage migratory shorebirds so that we can improve habitat and expand the habitat that's already there for those species because all of those sites are really important for uh, migratory shorebirds. Something that, um, and I'll, I'll reiterate what uh, you and Nick have said too, like it's been wonderful working with such an engaged community. Everybody here is um, quite mindful of um, shorebirds and really wanting to protect their habitat which is wonderful. Um, so Nick you talked a little bit about foxes and, and predating on the eggs but the question's been asked do you know if dingoes also eat the eggs? Do dingoes also eat the eggs? Well I would I, I would say there's a difference in the behaviour so I would say what a fox would do is if a fox gets into an area where there's eggs or um, bandicoots or whatever the animal is it would go and kill the lot it will take the lot out. It won't necessarily eat the lot, but it will take the lot. And what it would do is it will cache, that means bury out, bury in the egg or bury in whatever it's eating into another area because I believe, I don't know if this is true, but I believe it's always preparing for that winter, that snowy winter, the Northern Hemisphere winter that never comes to Australia. So I think it's in its nature, might be wrong there, but I think it's, in, it's always in its nature to kill everything and cache everything. Um, a dingo, on the other hand, we haven't had a dingo take an, an egg um, that I know of, but if it did, I don't think it would do its the fox's behaviour of taking like it did in 2001 is all of them. I can't see that happening. Like a fox, I can't even see a cat doing that, and cats aren't much. Better. I'd say that's the main difference is that that's why foxes and fox control is is pivotal to the success because one is a massive problem, and um, while we do get dingoes in the area, I yeah, I haven't seen them take an egg. I do see their tracks in the morning, but I don't see them, haven't seen it happen. Um, but in saying that, in the, to tell the difference between dingo and domestic dog, is that there's usually a human footprint close by. Um, and that's why you go, oh yeah, it's probably someone's pet that's climbing out. And, and it's usually just squash the egg or something. But um, yeah, that's where the difference is. 
that's the main difference. A fox would take the lot, um, while the, a dog dingo wouldn't. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to you both for giving up an evening and uh, presenting for us. I'd like to thank everybody for participating. We had a really good crowd tonight and, and thank you so much. Um, a big thank you to Hunter Local Land Services who helped us put on these events. Um, tonight's event was part of our Marine Encatchment Discovery Series and it's a regular program that we run. The next event that we have is actually in two weeks' time and that will be on our Saving Our Species, the Many River Turtle. A um, really interesting uh, topic, obviously very, very topical to this area. It's an amazing species that is only found here and we're, we're doing a lot of work to try and protect it. So if you're interested in attending that, if you haven't already signed up, you can do so through the Midcoast website um, and then you'll just get a, a link the same as this evening. So once again, thank you so much everybody for attending um, and uh, we hope to see you next time.